I really love uh, the way that God sees things. I love the way that he thinks about things. Here's the issue, for, I think, for many of us, is that <clears throat> we've grown up in the world around us, and the world around us is um, normally pretty negative. There's an inherent negativity in our culture, in our society, in the world around us. The world, it's a, the world is a problem-solving universe. Heaven isn't. That's because there are no problems in heaven. So they're not used to dealing with problems. They see everything as a possibility. And when Jesus came from heaven to earth, he came saying, you have heard it said, but now I say. He came bringing us uh, heaven's perspective so that we actually get a new way of seeing. We get a new lens for life. He came to give us heaven's mindset and to teach us a language that only heaven knows. So we've all grown up speaking the language of earth. Jesus came to teach us the language of heaven so that um, the church really should be a teaching heaven as a foreign language center because <laughs> it is a foreign language. The language of heaven is foreign to the earth and scripture even says that the natural mind can't receive it, can't understand it and thinks it's foolish. But there is a way of thinking, a way of seeing, a way of speaking that absolutely can dominate our life and our circumstances using the mind of Christ. He came saying, uh, what is impossible for man is very possible with God. And he said, all things are possible, only believe. And when he says that, what he means is, you get the easy part, you just get the belief. But when, when you see something, when you can think about something, and you can see it, you can step into it, you can believe for it, and there is a language that comes into your life that allows you to connect with God in trust and in faith. But in order for us to do that, we have to set aside the thinking that the world gave us, which means there is no place in our spirituality for logic, reason, or rationale, or intellectualism. Because even a quick flick through the Bible tells you that God is not logical. He's not rational because he asks you to believe in something that you can't see. Is that rational? Seriously? No. If everything could be accessed from God logically, we should not need faith. The Bible tells us to walk by faith and faith is where we believe for something that we can't see. But we know that it's going to happen. How does all that transpire? It comes out of our inner man of the spirit, interacting with who God is for us, and we're learning how to see things spiritually, spiritual appraisal. We're learning how to have our thoughts in line with the relationship that Jesus has with the Father. And we're learning to speak to things and to call things up as though they are not. We're learning the language of faith. So, you are designed to see something that is unseeable. You're designed to think about things in a way that the rest of the world around you would not think about them. And you're designed to talk to things and cause things to happen because there is a creative, the same creative word that's in God's mouth is actually in yours also. So we're learning how to be citizens of heaven living here on earth. So God's not logical, not reasonable, and much too clever to be an intellectual. <laughs> he's wise, but he's a spirit. And he sees things, 
in a completely, compellingly different way than we do. So in Christ, there are no problems, only possibilities. So if you read the Gospels, and you know, you should read the Gospels every single year, or maybe even every three months. It's really important for us that the words of Jesus become more important than the words of Paul. And that we see Paul's ministry through the light of the Gospels. And we don't see Jesus through the light of the epistles. That's really important. Why? Because we're following presence. And I don't want to be a disciple of Paul. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to understand presence. I want to understand what is it that he brought into every situation that made it become radically different that 5,000 people could be fed with a few fish sandwiches with enough left over to feed, to, feed, to feed a small village. I want to know what happened between him and Zacchaeus that brought that little obnoxious little rat out of a tree, <laughs> and by the time he got to the feet of to where Jesus was, a decision was made that I'm going to give half my goods to the poor and anyone that I've defrauded, which was a lot of people, I'm going to pay them back four times as much. How could Jesus invite one guy to supper and cause a whole community to become rich in the same moment? What on earth was happening? Everywhere Jesus went, hey, get a concordance, Look up the word marvel. Seriously. Look up the word marvel or marvelous. Most of the uh, scriptures will be in the Gospels and they'll all be about Jesus. How everything he did caused people to marvel. People marveled at him. And he said, I will do this so that you can marvel. He's not backward in coming forward in this thing. No, he's like, hey, I'm marvelous, I'm going to teach you how to walk with me, and you'll marvel that everybody else will think you're marvelous too. (laughs) Welcome to the gospel. Everything about God is marvelous. What we need is a lifestyle that's absolutely dependent upon majesty, that we understand that we are people of the king, We're kingdom people. We have access to a lifestyle that is marvelous, that is full of majesty, that displays the sovereignty and the supremacy of Jesus. That's what we have to offer. And what that means is you can't be ordinary. Just saying. You can't be ordinary because you have Christ living in you And that makes you a magnet for everything that is brilliant and extraordinary. Because if Christ is in you, then the glory of God is never far from your life and your circumstances. So if Christ is in you, all of heaven is attracted to Jesus in you. So we're having to come to terms all the time that, I don't know if you know this or not, but you're not on your own. There are two people inside here. One of them is you. The other one is the one who never leaves you nor forsakes you. That what's different between the old covenant and the new covenant is the old covenant was a visitational culture. The new covenant is a habitational one. The Bible says that you are a new creation. What does that mean? You're a race of people never seen in the earth before Jesus. Everyone before Christ had the power of God come on them. It could lift off them. But now in Christ, God comes and he makes his abode in you. And so he never leaves you nor forsakes you. So he's always with you. And he's with you to teach you how to be a citizen of of heaven here on earth. He's teaching you how to think like he thinks. How to see like he sees, how to talk like he talks. It's teaching you how to grow up into Christ in all things. 
And a big part of that initiation into that is that because you have Christ living inside you, never again will anything be impossible for you. That's what he's saying here. With man, all things, all manner of things are impossible, but with God, all things now become possible. What that means is you're never the victim of an impossibility ever again. Because now in Christ, we get to turn problems into possibilities. Here's the thing about the Lord. He refuses ever to work with a negative. Because there are no negatives in heaven. What he does is he converts that negative thing into something else so that he deals with that. Take your old self, for example. Before Christ, you were a sinner, lost, away from God, and then suddenly Christ comes into your life, and you start to learn about the power of the cross, and you realize when you read Romans 6, verses 3 to 11, it talks about that when Christ died, you died. And you understand that when he died, he didn't just die for you, he died as you. And so that in Christ, your old man is dead, and it's buried, that's what we do baptism for, and then when it's raised from the dead, it's raised to newness of life, the old life stays in the grave, but you, you not only take part in the crucifixion as being in Christ, but also in the resurrection you are in Christ, and he raises you up to newness of life. Why did he kill you off? Because he didn't want the bother of changing you. He didn't want the hassle of trying to change you. And so he says to you, he gives you permission. Consider yourself dead to sin and be alive to me. And I will teach you the lifestyle of being alive to me. So what that means is when God looks at you, he doesn't see anything wrong with you. Because everything that was wrong about you, he killed it off. He's really happy about that. Now, we're not dealing with your sin. We've already dealt with it once and for all. Read the Bible. Yeah? So your old man is dead. What we're learning is there is a newer version of you, and that's the one the Holy Spirit is working with. So when the Holy Spirit puts his finger on a part of your life that's not working, what's he doing? He's pointing to the site of your next upgrade. He's pointing to the site of your next miracle. He's saying, this is brilliant. Let's get to work on that next. So your old man is dead. So we don't have a sin nature anymore, but we do have a sin habit. And habits can be broken. Right? So what we have is we have situations in our life that need renovation. They need the cross to come in, and it's brilliant. God enables us to uh, be complete in Christ and then also come into completion. What that means is God gives you everything up front and then teaches you how to walk in it. So you have fullness right at the beginning and he teaches you how to stay full. You are complete in him and he teaches you what that completion looks like. You have fullness in him. He teaches you how to live in fullness. So everything about your life is absolutely, brilliantly positive because when God looks at you, he sees you in Christ and he says yes and amen. Even before you've asked a question. He says everything in Christ is yes and amen. It's like, Lord, isn't that a bit dangerous? These are Texans. They'll just take advantage. <laughs> and he's going, I hope they do. Someone needs to take advantage of me. Here's the thing. When God grants you something, he expects you to take him for granted. He gets a little bit antsy when you don't. <laughs> you are designed to have, more, to have a life that carries more than you can hold. So that you give it away constantly. And what that means is that nobody is safe from a blessing. Because you're around. It means we're never subject to never neg neg any negativity. The world is inherently negative, but the kingdom isn't. It's like there's no frustration in heaven. You think anyone standing around the throne right now going, <sighs> <laughs> <sighs> I 
how much longer is this worship service going to go on for? <laughs> I could kill one of the angels for a coffee. <laughs> no one's, there's no frustration in heaven. So here's the deal. If it doesn't exist in heaven, it can't exist here. If it's not intended, it cannot be allowed. If it's not intended, it cannot be allowed. If it's not in Christ, we don't want it. We don't accept it. So what is it about this Christ life that turns everything upside down and inside out? It's a mindset. It's a perception. It's a language that he carried from heaven to earth. And when you read the Gospels, what you are seeing is Jesus saying, this is how we do stuff in heaven. Amen. And then he says to us, greater things than these shall you do. What does he mean by that? I'm just here to teach you the basics. Y'all are going to do things way better than I'm doing them. Because we're saving the best stuff for you to do. We're going to teach you to be as brilliant as me. Because he actually knows that he's amazing. Amen. And like the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has no problem telling you that he's a genius. Because he is. He knows everything. He searches all the depths of God which means that the Holy Spirit has a bigger search engine than Google. Because <laughs> he's searching all the depths of God. Why? So that he can disclose everything about Jesus to you. So that fullness is not an option. Fullness is the way it is. Abundance is not just for a few people. It's for all of us to learn to step into the majesty of this lifestyle that Jesus came to give us. That you are a habitation of God by the Spirit, which means God is living in you, which means that all of heaven is attracted to you, which means if Jesus is living in you, the Holy Spirit is there, you're accessing a way of thinking that's totally extraordinary. And what it means is, you, don't, you are not subject to the world around you. You are making yourself vulnerable to the kingdom. Just saying. <laughs> Brilliant thinking is a way of life for you. Brilliant perceptions is how you view things. And your language is like nothing the world has ever heard before. You take all your cues from a realm that is nothing like the world around you. We grow up with the way the world thinks. But in the kingdom, we have to do battle with the way the world thinks. So, the God of possibilities is here to teach you what's possible in every situation. So we have to make every situation vulnerable to the majesty of God. If we don't make that vulnerable to the majesty of God, we will become vulnerable to it. And that's not who you are. It's time for us to stop living below the line of our privilege and start to live above it. That means we see things the way God sees it, we think about it. We have that same mindset that Jesus would have about it. And we have a language that's different. And we convert negativity into something else. It's like in our thinking when we have negative thoughts about ourselves. You know, if all your thinking has brought you to a place you don't like, have another thought. Because <laughs> clearly that one is not working for you. Right? Right? What does the world tell us to do? It tells us to work on that thought. What does the kingdom tell us to do? It tells us to change that thought for the better one and work on that. Amen. The kingdom never works on a negative. It changes it into something else and works on that. 
So when you get a problem in life, this is how heaven would see it. No problem can come to you without a promise and a provision attached to it. Why? Because problems are designed to bring you into your provision through a promise. So every promise, every problem has a promise and a provision attached to it. Literally attached. You can't have one without the other. And what we're learning to do is to, st- is to see the promise, step into the promise, and understand then that the situation that's occurring is designed to get me to live in that promise and move into that provision. So what happens then when you get a, a problem and you know who Jesus is for you? You get excited about that problem because it's amazing because what if the size of the problem tells you the size of the promise? And what if a promise is always bigger? So if the promise is bigger than the problem, how much bigger is the provision going to be? So you're starting to get stretched in your thinking and your perception and your language. So when you get a problem, you call your best friend. Hey, John, it's Graham. How's it going? <laughs> hey, did you see the game last night? Man alive. How many times are they going to pull that game out of the fire in the last two minutes? I tell you, supporting this team, I need a bigger heart. I need a heart like an elephant. My heart, you're like pounding in my chest. I know. <laughs> yeah, it was cool. Hey, listen, I'm calling you because I got a problem. Yeah, I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah. No, I came this morning. Yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. It looks pretty big. <laughs> I'm thinking, man, if I'm careful, I could keep this around for like two or three months, you know? <laughs> yeah, I knew something was up because the Holy Spirit came early. And you know what he's like, Mr. Enthusiasm, eh? <laughs> so he was like bouncing around the walls. I knew something was up. And then this problem came, and it's like, man, it's big. No, I haven't opened it yet. I've been too busy manifesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm looking at it thinking, OMG. <laughs> if the problem's that, if that big, how much bigger is the promise? I know, I've not even opened it yet. I've just been, I'm beside myself. It's like, here I am and there I am, and we're next to each, to each other, and we're both manifesting. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, how are you doing? <laughs> you haven't got a problem. Well, hang in there, man. <laughs> One's bound to come, right? <laughs> I mean, God is faithful. <laughs> You're bound to get one. Yeah, just hang in there and believe, man. Something, something good's going to happen. Hey, but listen, um, do you want to share this one with me? <laughs> no, it'd be cool. Hey, but listen, dude, when you get a problem, I'll be expecting a phone call, right? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, how soon can you get here? 40 minutes. Brilliant. Hey, are you passing St. Arbucks? Could you get me a coffee? <laughs> That'd be great. Okay, see you in a few. Every problem comes with a promise and a provision. Why? It's the kingdom. It's what the kingdom is like. The kingdom is unlike anything in the world. It's a different realm. It's a different dimension of life. It's a different way of seeing, thinking, speaking, believing, acting, walking, and so on. We're here to convert negatives into something brilliant. Why? Because God will not have you as his people to be victimized by anything. You're not under anything. Truth to tell, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places far above things. So we need a perspective 
that comes from up here, not from down there. We need a mindset that's not driven by the world around us, but it's actually driven by the kingdom that is within us. And we need a new language. And I'm not talking about tongues, so that's a good start. We need a language that describes who God is and who God is for me. We need that kind of language. Every negative thing around you is designed to give you an upgrade. Why? See, <clears throat> when Jesus died on the cross and God put all of your sin onto him, he didn't just put all of your behavior, he put all of your negative emotions, all of your negative thinking. He put all of those things there, any sarcasm, cynicism, pessimism. He put all of that died on the cross too, yeah? So you're not allowed to think negatively or talk negatively. Bad Christian. <laughs> you're not allowed to think negatively at all about anything. Why would you want to when there is a way of thinking in Jesus that is absolutely stunning? It's brilliant. And it opens you up to a whole realm of possibilities. Every obstacle is designed to elevate you. Now sometimes, you know, it's like you're walking along and suddenly this brick wall comes down in front of you and there's some kind of obstacle. It could be something at work, uh, something in relationships, it could be finances, it could be whatever it is. Something is there, it's in front of you and it stops you moving forward. And sometimes, you know, we want to blame it on somebody else. It's like, I'm so frustrated. No, you're not frustrated. I mean, you're choosing frustration, but you're actually not frustrated. And the only reason you're choosing frustration is because you haven't got used to a brilliant way of thinking. So you're defaulting. You're defaulting to the old man, whereas you could actually be upgraded to the new man, which is who you really are if you're in Christ. And that is our lives. We default to the world around us. We default to our own tradition as a human being. We default to the culture that we grew up in. We default to something when everything that God is doing is to elevate us out of that place into a different way of thinking. If God is trying to make you like him, that means he's going to change the way that you think. I mean, totally change the way that you think. Because here's the thing, he doesn't want to think like you. <laughs> he doesn't want to be made in your image. Uh, there is a reason why he killed you off. Because <laughs> he didn't want to deal with your stuff. He wanted to make you new. He wanted you to consider yourself to be dead to that and alive to this. The question is, what is God making you alive to? Why do you have these difficulties and circumstances? They're all there as a shortcut. They're all there to give you an upgrade. They're all there to elevate you. They're all there to teach you that there's a whole new design of you that needs to come out. They're all showing you this is who you are. They're all telling you, don't think on this level, think on this level. They're all opportunities for you to grow up into Christ in all things. What we're learning is we're learning how to be full when we actually got needs. We're learning how to get our needs met, but then we're also learning how to step into our inheritance. Every single thing in your life is a learning opportunity, and it's designed to teach you how to become like Jesus. So here's the thing. Can we stop complaining? This is my two-word counseling ministry. Stop it. That was really impactful, right? <laughs> Stop it. I'm still refining that counseling thing. <laughs> but I have a vision. If the whole prophetic gig doesn't work out, I'm going to open like a little um, hut in the biggest parking lot in town. And I'm going to have one of those little strip things that when a car rolls over it, a little bell goes off. 
and I'm just going to slide the door open. And the guy will look at me from his car and say, I don't love my wife. And I will say, love her. And he'll go, dude, that's amazing. Here's 10 bucks. <laughs> Two-word counseling ministry. And then another car will come, ding, I'll slide the window. I haven't got a job. Get one. <laughs> dude, that's amazing. Here's $5. It needs a little bit of work, but I think I'm onto something. <laughs> Do you know what our real problem is? We don't realize how amazing we are. We don't realize how brilliant we really are in Christ. We don't see life from the standpoint of His Majesty. We don't understand that his supremacy, that he really has conquered everything, and that he came to bring heaven to earth and teach us how to be citizens of heaven here on earth. The Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. That's what we're learning. As he is, so are we in this world. Every single situation in your life is designed to make you more like Jesus. We have to stop crying out for rescue and start looking for majesty. Start looking for God's supremacy. The Father has never been overwhelmed by anything. Jesus is undefeated. And the Holy Spirit always leads us in triumph. I am an unashamed triumphalist. Amen. I'm a celebrant. I want to celebrate the majesty and the sovereignty of God. I want to know what it is to be full of who Jesus is. And a part of that is that very often we are defeated by the mindset that we have. So Romans 12, 2 says that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. Most of us lose it in the space between our ears, in our thinking. We think negatively, we're losing it. Jesus has come to give us his mindset. There is a mind set on the spirit that's full of life and peace. Our thinking is a critical thing. Your circumstances are not the problem. Your perception of your circumstances is the problem. If you're in Christ... So are all your circumstances. What does it look like for you to take that circumstance and put it into Jesus? To surround it with the presence of God. To look at it the way that he would look at it. There's a discipline here that comes out of the fact that Jesus is delightful. There's a discipline here that enables us <coughs> to walk with passion and to, walk, and to be delighted about what's happening because we know who God is for us. And to know that God will go to extraordinary lengths to teach us how to walk in him, how to live in him, how to be in him. I'm in church one day and, um, and I'm going from one meeting to another and I'm walking down this corridor, and I'm late, and so I'm walking fast, and the door opens at the other end, and a woman starts walking towards me. And the closer she gets, I get this sense of impending doom, <laughs> that she's going to ask me a question. I want to be able to just walk past and say, hey, how's it going? I'm fine, thanks, you know, and get to this meeting. 
But I, I know she's going to st- I know it in my Noah, she's going to stop me. <laughs> and sure enough, she gets like 30 feet from me and she stops right in the middle of the <laughs> corridor and she's not a slim lady. <clears throat> so I get close to her and she looks at me and she says, so uh, you're a prophet, right? I said, so it has been rumored. <laughs> She said, well, I've, got, I've just come from the doctor. I've got cancer. It's inoperable, and I'm going to die in six months. So my question is, will I live or die? I said, sweetie, I don't do births, marriages, or deaths. <laughs> and here's the thing. You know, she's um, an older girl, so you don't know whether, you know, I'm always up for praying for people, but you don't know whether this is her time, whether to prepare her for her time or, or what. So I'm in that place. I'm saying, sweetie, I'd be delighted to pray for you. But there is a question you need to ask the Lord. And it's my favorite question. And I pray it in, I ask it in every situation I get into. Lord, what is it you want to be for me now that you couldn't be for before? What is it you want to be for me now that you couldn't be before. So I pray with her, and I say, you should ask the Lord this question. Now, we're in the same church. You got my number, so give me a call. You know, if you want me to pray for you tomorrow, I'll pray for you tomorrow. I'm, I'm cool. So just give me a call. So, but the Lord, if you ask that question, the Lord will answer it because he wants to be something for all of us constantly, continually, and in different ways. The reason we have different situations is because God wants to be something different for us each time so we get to understand what this fullness really is all about. So um, what is it you want to be for me now that you couldn't have been when I didn't have cancer? Great question. The next day she calls up and she said, nothing's happened. I said, sweetie, keep asking the question. The Bible says, ask and keep on asking. Keep asking the question. He's going to answer it. If God doesn't speak initially, he always speaks eventually. You just got to hang in there with him. And waiting on the Lord is not a trial. It's a pleasure. Because you know he's going to answer. Right? So then waiting on him becomes a delight. I know you're going to answer this question. But I'm just hanging out. So what is it you want to be for me now? She phones me on the third day, the sixth day, the ninth day, the eleventh day, the thirteenth day, the fifteenth day. On the seventeenth day, she's still praying. She goes to the grocery store. She's walking down an aisle. And at the end of the aisle, a woman comes around with a shopping cart and two small kids. Um, An eight-year-old girl and I think a four-year-old child. And, so, and she recognizes her that she used to sit next to her in, in, in class, in high school. So they're like reconnecting. I haven't seen you for ages and so on. And they're chatting, you know. And the eight-year-old girl starts pulling on her mother's dress saying, Mommy, 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 darling, not now. I'm talking. So they carry on talking. Mommy, 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 sweetie, not now. Just be patient. I'm talking. A few minutes later, mommy, mommy, what is it? That's the lady I saw in heaven. Here's the thing. This is the 17th day. 16 days before, this girl has a dream that she goes to heaven, and she sat in Jesus' office having a chat, like you do, you know? <laughs> but she sat having a chat, And and they're talking away and having a great time. And she notices this framed photograph on his desk. And the picture is this woman. And she says, Jesus, who's that woman? He said, oh, that's someone when you wake up, that's someone that you're going to talk to. And when you talk to her, I want you to give her this message. And he gives her a folded piece of paper. When she wakes up the next day, She has a piece of paper in her hand. 
And she's been carrying that piece of paper for 16 days. And now she sees the woman in the grocery store. And she says, Mommy, that's the woman. She tells her the story of the dream, photograph. You're in a photo on Jesus' desk. I mean, that's got to be the height of something, right? (laughs) And she gives her the piece of paper. Now, bear in mind, the question is, what is it you want to be for me now? She unfolds the piece of paper, and it says, I am the Lord that heals you. Now, here's the thing. He could have said that to her 16 days before. He could have sent her an angel. She could have had a dream. But he didn't do any of that. Because he's fun. (laughs) He has a lot of people to deal with. He likes to do things differently. He doesn't like to do things the same all the time. Plus, he likes to include people in our lives that we don't know and and so on and so forth. He's fun. So here's the thing. She unfolds that. She reads the message. She starts crying. She tells her friend, you know, I've got cancer. And she tells her her side of the story. And now here's the thing is, these two guys actually, um, years before, they fell out at school, like girls do, they fall out, <laughs> you know? So, and they hadn't talked to each other for a while, but now suddenly they're older and, you know, life's too precious not to have, you know, have offenses and stuff. So here they are reconnecting, but God is joining them back together again through this child who had a dream. And now this child gets to see the power of dreams and how God loves to communicate in dreams and visions, Yeah. Um, because they're not logical. It's not logical, you know, for God to take a child to heaven, frame, photograph, message, wake up, piece of paper, be in the grocery store, see this woman, say something, she gets healed. Why does he do things like that? He just loves to do things like that. Get over yourself. Never tackle a problem on the same level that it appears. Because the problem is designed to elevate you. Come on, seriously? All right, logically. (laughs) How do you expect to get an upgrade? What if they all come in different shapes and sizes? Sometimes people can come walking into your life and, and give you something that upgrades you. What if the Lord has designed a whole variety of circumstances to give you an upgrade? And what if most of them are negative? Wouldn't it be so like God to park an upgrade right next to a problem? Come on. Wouldn't it be so like him that in your moment of real difficulty... Suddenly, there's this huge blessing also available. Wouldn't it be like, God, that on your worst day, give you something amazing? Here's the thing about us. When we live in a world-centered Christian culture, we only ever see the problem. We don't even think that there's something brilliant right next to it. Because we're so used to just dealing with a negative and getting overwhelmed. And, we, you know, most of us even panic in advance. <laughs> you know? Well, if that happens, I'm going to be really fearful. <laughs> we say stuff like this. Or we say things like, you know, um, <clears throat> well, I knew that was going to happen. That's like some weird prophetic gift going on. <laughs> but I knew that was going to happen. I've been, getting too, I've been getting blessed too much with this one. I've been getting blessed too much. There's bound to be a backlash. Come on, who's ever had that thought? I am not the only stupid person in this room. Thank you. One honest person over there.
Isn't it just like the goodness of God to put something brilliant next to something awful? And maybe that's what he means when he says, I make everything work together for good. What does it mean then? Look for the presence of God. The question is, how do you seek the Lord when he never leaves you alone? (laughs) How do you seek the Lord when he never forsakes you and never leaves you? What it means is you're seeking his presence in your circumstances. Where is Jesus standing right now in my... There he is. I just want to go and stand right next to him, you know? What are you saying into this situation? Because that's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear stuff on this level. I want to hear stuff on this level. What are you saying about this? How do you see this? What is it that you want to do? What is it you want to be for me now? They're great questions. Here's the thing. Never ask the why question. Why me? Why now? Why this? Because the why question never gets answered on earth. It's an invalid question that makes you an invalid if you ask it. It's a victim question. The two best questions you can ever ask were both asked on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2.12 and Acts 2... Accessing, accessing, 37. (laughs) I was doing my Google thing right there. Were you impressed by that? (laughs) That was me trying to be the Holy Spirit and do the Google thing. (laughs) Acts 2.12 and uh, 2.37. What does this mean and what must I do? The two best questions ever. What does this mean for my relationship with you? What does this mean for you and I? What is this situation about relationally between me and you, Lord? What is, is there an upgrade here in terms of how I see you, how I know you, how I walk with you? What's, what's in this situation for me and you and our relationship? Because <clears throat> you know that primary purpose, let's make man in our image, Genesis 1.26. Let's make man in our image. Primary purpose, we're bringing all sons into glory. So primary purpose is about him making you like him. So everything is relational. Okay, I didn't say that in English, clearly. Sometimes I lapse into Polish or Hungarian. (laughs) I get excited and I start speaking a different language. Everything but everything but everything in your life is about one thing. You being made in the image of God. That means in every situation, you have to think like he would think. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to train you in that. It means you get to see something the way that he sees it. And it means you don't be moved away from that because this is your birthright in Jesus. Don't give it up. Because if you don't accept the heavenly vision of something, you're going to have to accept the worldly vision of it. And we all know what that looks like. If you don't get to think about this the way that Jesus would think about it, you're going to think about it the way the enemy wants you to think about it. If you don't have a language that's the same language that Jesus used in the Gospels, you're going to use that which is the language of faith and power and possibility. You're going to start using the language of unbelief and fear and doubt Everything in your life is about you becoming Christ-like. So you get the chance in everything to step into a little bit more of how he sees things and thinks and speaks and stands and acts and walks. It's what makes life fascinating for us. Because we know in the goodness of God, there's always an outcome that he sets Otherwise, if you don't accept the way that he does things, you're going to set the outcome from a place of unbelief. Come on, you know that's true. (laughs) 
You don't want to be leading those situations. You want to be led by the Spirit. And that's what it means. The Spirit leads you into all truth. He takes everything that belongs to Jesus and he discloses it to you. That means in any situation, the role of the Holy Spirit is to tell you what's going on, to tell you who God is for you. It's relational. You're learning how to be made in the image of God. Everything is relational. God is never distant. He's in here. And so everything in your life, all circumstances, are designed to teach you about possibilities. All things are now possible. So we're going to have to come to terms with favor and goodness <laughs> and power <laughs> and possibilities and majesty and everything flipping well, turning out for good all the time. <laughs> so annoying. What if you like whining too much? <laughs> I'm talking about whining with an H in it. <laughs> Just in case you were about to get offended. <laughs> whining with an H in it. What if we like whining just a tad too much? Well, can I do that and whine? No. Sorry. That's one of the things that's not possible. What if it teaches you how to live with a smile on your face, if not have a grin plastered on your face, because you're actually realizing how incredibly good God really is. But here's the thing, you're, it's not a theory anymore. It's not a doctrine. It's actually a reality in your life. Jesus came saying, you have heard it said, but now I'm saying. And what he said and what he did made all the difference. It's time, you know, we really stopped acting like Christians and started acting like believers. Because on days, you know, those two things are like a million miles apart. <laughs> but you're believers, right? Yeah. What is it you're believing? What is it you're believing about your situation right now? You are believing something. There's been no doubt about that. If you're believing in a negative, you're believing something. We are always believing. Is what you're believing, is it killing you? Or is it upgrading you? Is it keeping you down? Or is it elevating you into your rightful place in Christ? The Holy Spirit, who is the resident genius of heaven here on earth, he knows how to take everything that belongs to Jesus and disclose it to you, to tell you, hey, in this situation, this is what we're doing. Why don't you join in with us? This situation is designed to give you an upgrade. Sometimes, you know, when you hit an obstacle and there's no way through it, it's because God doesn't want you to push through it. He wants to elevate you because when you get an obstacle that's absolutely impassable, what the Lord is saying is, you're done on this level. I put that thing there because I don't want you walking in this low level any longer. I want you to walk on a different level. You know, on every new level, you meet a new devil. So you have to beat the devil on the level that you're on. Amen. But when God is done with that level, because maybe he's bored with it, <laughs> when he's done with that level, he will put an obstacle in front of you that you can't get through. Anybody in that place right now feeling that there's something in front of me and I can't break through it? Come on, where are you? I see that hand. I see that hand. I've always wanted to say that. I see that hand. <laughs> I see that hand. I feel like Billy Graham. This is awesome.
What the Lord is saying, I believe, is you're done on this level. I put that thing in front of you. I don't want you getting through it. I want to elevate you to a different level. So whoever that is, stand up. I'm going to pray for you right quick. There are more people standing than put their hands up. (laughs) But that's absolutely brilliant. Honestly, I don't think God cares right now if you've got an obstacle or not. He just loves who you are. Do you know what the most fabulous thing about this life is? We get to discover Jesus. And we get to change, which is what all of us want to do. I mean, that's what all your wives told me anyway. (laughs) Okay, assume the position. (laughs) (coughs) Father, I thank you. You are in charge. You're in charge. You rule. You reign. Right now, Lord, we stand before you and we're saying there's something in front of us that I can't get through. And I believe you're saying, I know. You're not supposed to. This is me saying, you're finished on this level. You need to come up higher. So in the name of Jesus, by the authority that you've given me as a prophet in your kingdom, I declare in Jesus' name, elevation to come into our lives. I ask for an upgrade in our thinking, an upgrade in our perceptions, and an upgrade in our language. The Lord, that right now, every one of us standing, and even those listening months later who weren't here today, you're so not getting away with it. (laughs) No matter where you are, God is elevating you. He is lifting you up into a higher place. So I ask that that higher place would be in our thinking, It would be in our perception, how we see things, and it would be an upgrade in our language. But also, Lord, I ask you for a higher walk in the realm of the Spirit, that you would take us to a place above problems, so that, Lord, that we could see it the way that you always see it. So I pray for a a time, Lord, of of elevation in thinking, in our perception and language, but also, Lord, in our faith and our encounter with you and our experience of you, they would all go to a new and higher level. And I ask that your passion for us would take hold of us in a fresh way, that your love, Lord, would surround us and infill us, that this elevation would bring us into another level of fullness and abundance, but especially that your delight and your passion for us would captivate our hearts in a deeper way so that our encounter with you goes to a different dimension, emanates from a different platform, and that our ongoing experience of you would cause us, Lord, to be more open, fulfilled, generous, and happy. And I ask it, Lord, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Hey, thanks for listening. I appreciate it.